I want to share with you tonight. I want to go to the book of Nahum, chapter 1, and I'm going to read just one verse, verse 9. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9. It is our custom that we stand for the reverence of God's word. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me. If you have it in your Bible or your smart device, I would like you to signify by saying, I have the bread. Nahum chapter 1 verse 9 says, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. And all of God's people said, Amen. I don't have much voice. And so it it is very possible with our short attention span that you may not remember most of what I say tonight. So I want to at least give you what I believe the phrase or the word of the Lord is pertaining uh, to your life and your situation. Share it with the person beside you. You can be seated and we just wrap this up. Look at your neighbor and tell them you will never have to face that again. All right. All right. I'll be seated. I'll be seated. Now listen, I got this thing tonight. Now people talked about us at the ramp years ago when we started the church and they thought maybe we were putting on or we were being hypocritical because when one of us would dance everybody would dance and they used to say stuff like the Holy Ghost can't be hitting all of y'all at the same time and I finally was honest with them and says no truly maybe we don't all feel it at the same time but we believe in that scripture says oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together in other words if something bears witness with somebody on my road that's an indication that God is in the neighborhood maybe you just see it before I see it but I need you to point to somebody ask him did you hear what I said tell him I don't know what you went through last year but I got a word from the Lord tell her you will never never ever 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 have to face that again okay if somebody on your row is jumping you better jump with them if somebody on your row is shouting you better shout with them if somebody on your row is screaming you better scream with them because what he's doing on that end it's coming down to you oh oh Never, never, never. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You will never. You will never have to. Y'all be seated. I want to have a conversation with you. I'll uh, I'll introduce this conversation with you uh, with the topic of assignment right we all have one oftentimes we don't have the one that we want but we all have an assignment an assignment you don't get to choose your assignment you only get to choose whether you surrender to it or not you know It's important to know this, that you can be faithful to God. I mean, faithful to God, faithful to the church, faithful in service. And still, you don't get to become what you want to be in the kingdom. You know, you know, that's that that's good saying for the military. uh, It's good saying for motivational speakers. But I believe that when we are born, we're born with a God purpose. And many of us are behind schedule because we have failed to come in agreement with God's assignment for our life. Yes. 
I need you to look at the person beside you and say this. Tell them it's not going to work for you until you come in agreement with it. In 2024, let's normalize surrender. Let's normalize obedience. We don't need to uh, redo the story of Jonah. <laughs> the story of Jonah is there for our inspiration and our admiration that we don't have to repeat it. I'm speaking to you in this room that there's a grace of acceleration that's going to happen for some individuals in this room who's willing to obey quickly. Uh oh, I didn't lost the church through here. No, no, no. I mean, to obey quickly. In other words, you don't have to feel it to do it. Many of us have missed out on God moments because we're waiting for clarity before we obey. Thank you. Y'all, somebody talk to me here. We're still waiting for God to explain to us the details. We're still waiting to feel okay with it. But you don't have to agree with God to obey God. As a matter of fact, it doesn't go the direction we want it. In our minds, we want God to make it clear, then we'll obey. But actually, obedience brings clarity. There are moments you got to walk it out even when it doesn't make sense. There are times where you're going to God for a miracle and he puts mud on your face. Scream at somebody, tell them no mud, no miracle. I'm speaking to about 40 of you that went through some embarrassing, humiliating moments on last year. And what you went through looks nothing like what God promised you. Until you can be faithful with questions, my God. Until you can be faithful to God when he's silent, you're not ready for the next. I come to tell somebody in this room, he's about to make sense out of the last 14 months. I'm talking about after you sold, after you turned around, after you served, after you danced, after you gave the special offering, you haven't seen anything I come to tell you the only reason why it hasn't happened yet is because it's bigger than what you pray for my God I come to tell you before God take it back he gonna add more to it I need to hear those in this room who've had to serve him without understanding him yeah, you, don't, you don't get to choose you don't get to choose your assignment because the truth is most of us would not have chosen it for ourselves. Like this, this office of the prophetic. It's become very popular now to embrace the, the title prophet. When I was growing up in the classical Pentecostal church, I'm, I'm old enough to say I grew up in the classical Pentecostal church. I say classical Pentecostal church, not this new Pentecostal church. Because we who grew up in classical Pentecostal church, we remember what it was not to want to be labeled Pentecostal. We who grew up in classical Pentecostal church, Pentecost or being Pentecostal was more than a praise break. It was a way of living. You could spot us in the storm. Y'all call it being churchy now. No, but when we grew up, the saints were quickened. And they didn't say, what's up? They said, praise the Lord. No matter where we were, we had our greetings. We had our attire. We had the way we moved, the way we operated. And when I grew up, those who were prophets did not carry the title. I'm serious. When I grew up, I didn't know anybody named prophet so-and-so and prophetess so-and-so. Now prophetess is some kind of modeling agency. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Prophet now is some kind of sorcery and some kind of money making machine. But when I was growing up, no one wanted to carry the title because to be a prophet was not popular. When we knew some prophetic person was coming to the church, they warned us before they came. And they say, y'all know Elder so-and-so is coming on Friday night. And you know what that did? It gave us all week to repent. The prophetic people I knew didn't have profile pictures and headshots. 
they were church women and mothers who would get caught up in the Holy Ghost and they would start walking around with their eyes closed and we would sit there with our head down and say Jesus, 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 Jesus. And when God moved on them, he moved on all of their senses. They, not just their voice, but they can say, I can smell sin. I smell sin. And when I look at this book, Nahum, who from a literary standpoint, we call him a minor prophet. But minor prophet is a description of his literary work. Not necessarily his office. What we call people major prophets or minor prophets. It's a, it's a label that's indicative of the length of the book. In other words, he didn't have a whole lot to say. But what he did say was God breathed. I've come to tell you that it's not about how loud you are. It's about how necessary you are. It's about how intentional you are. I need you to tell your neighbor, it don't have to be loud to be God. Hallelujah. It doesn't have to be big to be anointed. Nahum uh, only got a few chapters. We call him a minor prophet. He may be a minor prophet, but he has a major message. And when this book is introduced to us in verse 1, new translations of the scriptures, new versions, have translated the word Masa as message. But from its original context, that word is translated burden. It's not the message of of Nahum, it is the burden. You're not really anointed until it gets heavy sometimes. Mm. This is why when some of you are running for the microphone, there are others who retract. Not because we don't love God, it's because we're not ignorant concerning the price. We're, we're not ignorant concerning the weight, the responsibility. Some of us wish we could be anointed and anonymous, but the assignment won't let us. My God. I need you to tell somebody don't tell no lie if it ain't your testimony don't tell nobody don't tell nobody but if it's your testimony look at somebody and tell them my assault came because I was anointed I, I'm not, there, there are some things I would have never had to face unless I had said yes to God and that's why every year I show up I'm saying yes again I need about 50 of you in this room that know it cost you in the last season but you still got a yes Lord you still you still got a yes Lord why because is more than just a message is a burden the reason why some people quit every week is because they never got a burden you want to serve but do you have a burden for serving you want to operate but do you have a burden for the operation you want to help the vision but do you have a burden for the vision see because when you got a burden for something it will disrupt your sleep When you got a burden for something, you'll see it everywhere you go. You'll cut on a Netflix movie and it'll speak to you. When you got a burden for something, you'll drive down streets and you'll see buildings and it'll communicate something to you. When God put a burden on you, other folk will call you crazy. And they say, why are you still fooling with them Negroes? If I was you, I would have just cut them off. But when God put it in you, it'll make you forgive people who don't even have the capacity to apologize. When God put it in you, you'll say praise the Lord to folk who you knew sat around and had conversations conversations about you I need you to scream at somebody tell them God did this to me I'm not that good I'm not that wonderful I know the family I came from the mere fact that I can serve people who try to sabotage my character is because God gave me a burden God gave me a burden to keep serving people in 
and helping people who are ungrateful, who don't say thank you, who don't appreciate you, who critique you, who analyze you, who judge you. When they try to kill you with their lies, when you can destroy them with your truth, God put a burden on you, babe. God put a burden. God put a burden on you. God put a burden on you. You know you got a burden. Well, you didn't quit more times in your head than people know about. It's the burden. It's the burden of, it's the burden of the Lord. Nahum has a burden. It's not a popular assignment. Why? Because he's called to prophesy to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians. This Nahum from Elkos, an Elkoth, an Elkoshite with Hebrew uh, lineage, Nahum, with an unpopular message. This book starts out communicating the goodness of the Lord. Let's first lay a, a premise before I tell you what God says. He's good. <laughs> He's a good God. He's, he's a good God. And now we're in an Old Testament text with an Old Testament prophet. But the prophet starts out describing the goodness of God. Many of us, uh, unfortunately, and maybe unintentionally, have tried to make the God of the Old Testament different from the God of the New Testament. We've made the God of the Old Testament some sort of vengeful, murderous, angry God. And we've made the God of the New Testament all love, all compassion, and all mercy. But when I see God in the Old Testament, I see his mercy. Oh, I see his mercy. When he says, I'm going to destroy Sodom. And Abraham negotiates with him. Oh, I see his mercy when he says, I'm going to destroy all of the inhabitants of the earth. Y'all talk to me, Bible teachers in here. And, 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 and the Bible says he gives Noah a message and to build a boat and to preach for years, giving people a chance to repent. I see, I see. You talk about the day of God's judgment, but how many opportunities did God give them before he brought judgment? He's a same God. Same God. He's a, he's a merciful God. Say, so Naomi said, let's establish a premise that our God is good. But then he begins to progress in this poetic, prophetic prose and says, but not only is he good, he's holy. The God we serve, he's, he's holy. Mm. He, he's holy. I said something to him. Uh, Pastor Nathaniel, when I got ready to come up here, when the choir was singing, I, I was uh, excavating <laughs> this stage. And I almost wondered, did I have time to go to that side so I could use the rail to come up these steps? Because these steps are intimidating. <laughs> one, of the, one of the hardest things for me when I go preach at a church, is to walk from the chair to the podium. Then once I get here, I'll walk on top of pews, but coming up steps and walking up, it's an awkward thing for me. I don't even know how to walk. Because sometimes I feel like I'm clumsy standing still. Or maybe it is the the cultural background that raised me that makes it so hard for me to walk up these steps because when I was growing up this was not called a stage it was called a pulpit they didn't call this a podium they call it a roster And everybody couldn't walk up here. 
I remember when the nurses used to reach over from the choir stand and put down the water. But now we've changed the aesthetics of our churches to be more progressive, to illuminate the stages so that people's focus could be in the direction in which people are speaking and singing. But in the midst of the shifting of our church structures, we've missed some things in transition. Oh, I said we missed some things. Somewhere in the transition of putting lights on the stage people and having live stream services, people have made sure that their foundation is right, but not their spirit. They're practicing their runs and we have the live stream for the musicians and the musicians set up their own live stream on their phones to make sure they play the right chords and they get the right attention but we're missing the attention of the right one we forgot he's holy we forgot he's holy we forgot he's holy he's a holy God uh, y'all, y'all gotta talk to me. I said he's a holy God, and he only shows up where he's honored. My God, I'm not telling you you got to wear long sweeping skirts, and I'm not telling you you gotta take off your earrings, but you do need to take off some of your carnality. You need to be reminded, Hallelujah! You need to be reminded before you play, Hallelujah! You got to be reminded before you sing. He's a holy God. Sometimes when we say we want the power of the old church, we start pulling out tamarines. We start pulling out washboards. We start singing the old songs. But I want to tell you, the power of the old church was not the tamarines. It was not the washboards. It was not the sweeping skirts. It was reverence. Yeah, they had sin. Yeah, they had sin. Just like we got sin, but they acted differently about it. Some of us sin and are arrogant. We don't even try to hide it. And when your public standard is low, that means your private the standard is in the basement scream at somebody tell him he's still holy 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 holy. you bring it up I know y'all ain't gonna say nothing to me what about her no no my sins are ever before me when I step the sign that you don't want to be corrected is when you bring up other people's names when you're being challenged somebody scream holy it's still a holy God he's a holy God when you when you go to Israel and I do, I do trips to Israel every year, and the only reason why I was not there last month is because of the war. But when you go to Israel, uh, I, I love to take people and, and, and show them and teach Bible classes as I go to the Western Wall. It's not the wall of the temple, but it's the, it's the only existing wall that would have been the outer court wall of the last temple, which would have been called Herod's Temple. Uh, I like to take people to the Sea of Galilee because it's the same water. You know, I like to take people to the Pool of Bethesda, the five porches. I mean, it's, it's, it's so powerful how those things are still there and excavations are still unveiling the places of the scripture. But one of the most powerful places, Pastor Green, that I like to take people is to the Southern Temple Steps. The Southern Temple Steps. The southern temple steps would have been the steps that people entered into to go to the outer courts and to enter to worship in the temple. All of the uh, pilgrims would have come from Galilee, Judea, and made their journey into Jerusalem for Passover and Pentecost and come up these very steps, including Yeshua, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. He walked these very steps and those steps are still there today one of the most unique things about these steps is that these steps are uneven which is kind of strange because I'm always blown away how they built these grand structures 
in ancient times without computer technology. How they moved these huge stones that weigh tons upon tons upon tons without our modern machines. And then when it's time to build these temple steps, these steps are uneven, which to me would have been a more simple assignment. And while I'm sitting discussing this with Rabbi Pesach Wiliki, who is an Orthodox rabbi, he's not a, he's, he is not messianic, he doesn't believe in Jesus, but we have strong conversations about the Old Testament. He said, well, you know those steps were built uneven on purpose. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, why would they make the steps uneven with all these pilgrims? Uh, they finally get to Jerusalem and then you get, he says, well, think about this, Bishop. He says, when you walk up the steps in your house, you never look down. Why? Why do you not look down? It's because those steps are set evenly. They have the same amount of space between each other. So you casually bounce upstairs to your house without thinking about it. But if the steps are uneven, every step got to be a sure step. And God didn't want us running up on him. He wanted us to reverence his presence. And I pray for every worship leader in this room. I pray for every musician. <laughs> I pray every for every preacher in this room that the steps will be uneven for you again. That you'll be reminded that this is a holy assignment. I need you to push somebody to tell them this ain't about a check. This is an assignment. It's not about my talent. Yeah, you sound good. Oh, but you need the oil if any yoke's going to be destroyed. And God only shows up for those who reverences his holiness. All right, I got eight minutes and I'll be finished. He, he says, our God is good. Then he addresses God's holiness. And then he goes into God's judgment. This is what the burden was about because he's got to remind Nineveh, God is going to judge you. I want to say to, not to you in this room because none of you would say this, but I want to say to those who are watching online, who, when people challenge you, you say stuff like, well, only God can judge me. And, and you even, you got it even tattooed across your chest. Let me tell you something. What you need to be reminded is one day, God will. For, for all of those who, uh, who disrespect God and holy places, remember one day, God will. Will. You're going to have to answer to God for what you've done in this mortal body. Every deed, every word. I'm somebody ought to shout, Hall of Mercy. I'm so thankful I'm covered under the blood because if I had not gotten saved, if I had to answer for all my sins, I may as well quit right now. And if the righteous scarcely make it, where will the ungodly appear? And maybe we've been shouting about the wrong thing. We shout about our houses and our cars, and you should. And you shout about your office and your title, and you should. But Jesus says, if you're going to rejoice about anything, you ought to rejoice that your name is written without any assistance of the music. I need about a hundred of you all to praise him because you simply are forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You are forgiven. I know you say you'll reap what you sow, but I need somebody to shout right now for crop failure because there's some seeds. Come on. Hallelujah. God called death to because if I have to live that out, I might as well stop right now. God's judgment. And I know in this hour we want to preach nothing but grace. This is revival, right? This is revival. Nothing but grace. But the Bible says Jesus, full of grace and truth. If you preach nothing but grace, but don't tell people the truth, you're going to let somebody die and be destroyed. 
I need you to tell somebody, tell them, tell me the whole truth. Even when I roll my eyes, even when I get an attitude, tell me the truth. Love my soul enough. Hallelujah. Come on, tell me the truth. Tell me I need to apologize. Tell me I got the wrong attitude. Tell me the truth. And that's why when you got a pastor that loves you enough to correct you, stick out, stick it out with them. Hallelujah. Come on. I'm talking about somebody who's not so moved by your gift. Hallelujah. That they won't correct your spirit. Hallelujah. I need you to praise God if you got a good pastor. You, oh, your pastor don't have to be perfect, but I thank God I got a good pastor. I thank God for a pastor that loves me enough that says, you won't here last Sunday. Where were you at? Come on. I need a pastor good enough to call me in the office and say, you ain't been paying your tithes lately. Hallelujah. Where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. I thank God for somebody who loves me enough that says, you're not ready yet. Grace, and let, and let me hear you, and let me tell you this, and I'm going to move very quickly. Um, I needed the teaching of grace. I really did, because I'm going to be honest with you, I never felt good enough for God. Now, I told you about the power of the classical Pentecostal church, but I must give you the full counsel. After I followed all the rules, I never felt good enough. Because if you could keep the rules strong for a good day, it'll make you a little prideful. And then the moment you mess up on one of the rules, it'll make you feel condemned. So I needed the teaching of grace. I needed to know that, that when I sin and when sin abound, grace much more abounds. I needed to know that. I needed to know where there's sin in my life, God gives me grace. But the Bible says in the last days, there will be those, y'all pray for me as I go through here, okay? Y'all pray for me. Those who would turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Yes! God gives you grace when you sin. But Romans chapter 6 verse 1 ask a question shall we continue in sin oh y'all thought revival was a good church service no revival is when we repent revival is when we get back on the altar again shall we continue in sin that grace may abound God forbid how can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein know ye not that many of you they were baptized, were baptized into his death. Yes, I thank God for his grace. But grace is not weak. Grace is not an excuse for me to get comfortable. Oof. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you an opportunity to praise God. And some of you won't know how to respond to this. But I need you to, in this room who are spiritually mature. I want you to praise God for one thing and I'm going to move on. I want you to praise him for conviction. Do it now. Pray. Praise him because he didn't let you get away with it. Praise him because he didn't let you sleep. Come on, praise him because he didn't let you unpack it. Praise him because the Bible says God only chastens those that he loves. Come on, just 10 more seconds. Pray, pray, praise him. Woo. Hey, thank you for not taking your hand off of me. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, it could have been bad if it all would have hit the fan. I thank you for your grace, God. Hey, because what he's saying, the reason why this word is so strong against Nineveh, two reasons. Two reasons why this word is so strong. Because if you just pop up here, you're like, Dad, God is just, God is just hopping on them. But you read the text about his judgment, he's like, I'm going to plunder you to pieces. Like, man, hear me. Two reasons why God is operating with them in such a rough way. First of all, they're not just sinning, they're arrogant with it. I 
I need you to look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, don't get prideful. Don't, don't ever get above apologizing. Don't ever get above considering maybe you're wrong. Come on, never get to the point that you are sinning and prideful. What you went through on last year, you will never, never, ever, ever, ever have to face it again. I, I heard the Lord speak in Exodus. He said for the Egyptians, you see today, you will see no more, no more forever. Push your neighbor. He said, oh neighbor, I went through it and I got the proof. Tell him I cried over it and I got the evidence, but I never, y'all finish it, y'all finish it. I never have to face it again. There's about 32 of you in here. You had a scare with your health. Somebody had cancer. But I come to tell you, it ain't coming back. You will never have to face it again. I, I cried over it. And I suffered through it. And I heard the epistle declare that after you suffered a while, he said, I'll establish you and I'll perfect you. I need about 10 of you to just run up here and touch the altar and say, chapter closed. Chapter closed. This is not the end of my story. It's just the end of a chapter. Oh, I feel in my spirit something is shifting. I heard Paul say it. I got a feeling. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Push three people and tell them, glory is coming. Glory is coming. They saw you suffer. Now they're going to watch you reign. They saw you cry. Now they're going to see you reap. Glory. Glory is coming. I I endured the Babylonians and they afflicted me. I endured the Persians and they afflicted me. I endured the Assyrians and they afflicted me. But now I feel a shift. Many of the afflictions. Oh, the righteous, but the law, I said, but the law, he will deliver. Lay hands on somebody and tell them deliverance is coming. Now, let me tell you something. Many of you feel that where you are now is where you will always be. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you something. Now, tell you something about the devil. The is a liar. Where I am is about to shift. Something is about to change. Pull on somebody. Tell them I'm going back to God. Stay here if you want to. I'm going back to God. I want to be on the right side. I want to be in my assignment. I'm going back. Because he made me a promise that a thousand should fall at that side. Two, ten thousand at the right hand. But it will not, it will not come now me. Scream at somebody and tell me it's coming to my house. Run over to a family member and said it's going to happen for our family. Blood over your doorposts. Blood over your vehicles. Blood over your children. Buckets of blood. Buckets of blood. 
behind you. Hey, hey, hey. Don't tell people your business. You ain't gotta tell nobody the details. But I want you to shout, it's not coming back. It's not coming back. It's not coming back. You were never, hallelujah. You were never no more shot. Oh, listen. Oh, have my boys hear me. I want each of I can't get to everybody. It's about a, several of you. I wanna, I wanna get in your face and tell you this. I need, I need somebody in this room to help me. Give somebody beside you eye contact. Give them eye contact. I want you to look at them. Tell them you'll never have to face that again. Tell them whatever made you cry is about to turn around and bless your life. was going to break you. You served through it. You praised through it. You were helping other people through it. And they had no idea how hard it was. I come to tell you they had to serve under your depression. You had to serve in the midst of your anxiety. You'll never have to face it. The Bible says man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I pray that you are blessed by the message today. And if you want to continue to get more inspirational, motivational, and even more gospel messages, I encourage you to follow our YouTube channel or subscribe to our podcast. And today we want to give you an opportunity to partner what we're doing domestically here at our local church and what we're doing all over the world. There are ways to give. And remember, when you sow, that seed may leave your hand, but it'll never leave your life. The Bible declares to us that when we sow, seeds are connected to harvest. Well, I want you to remember that I know what it feels like to cry until you have no more tears left to cry. But after you finish crying, don't stop. Get up and keep going.